Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Bill's lesson today is in Luke chapter 11, titled, Prayer Diagram, Part 1. Good morning. How are you enjoying the fall? <laughs> Nippy weather out there. Whew. What's that? <laughs> beautiful up north. Beautiful up, yeah, but this is our beautiful, don't you remember? We are in the book of Luke, but I don't want you to turn there. Um, I want you to turn to the book of John, actually. I'm sorry, the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. There will be a lot of places today, but, but uh, we're going to be using the, the book of John as a jumping off place. I keep saying John. We're in Luke, so remember that. Everybody got that? All right, we're in Luke. But we're not going to be in Luke today. <laughs> we're going to be in the book of Matthew. We are going to look, use Luke as a jumping off place. In fact, we're going to be lo- using Luke chapter 11. We're, that's where we are, chapter uh, 11 there, uh, verses 1 through 4. But I want us to turn to the book of, to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. And uh, I want you to go there because, because, of, well, because of where our jumping off place here, is here in, in the book of Luke. You notice something that happens here in the book of Luke. Jesus is asked a question here on our, on our screen, one of his disciples, it says, says to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And it says, just as John taught his disciples, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, how would be your name? Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and, leads us not, and lead us not into temptation. Does that sound... Like the Lord's Prayer that you learned? Sounds a little different, doesn't it? Because what? Because Jesus forgot how to pray, right? Is that what it is? You're like, wait a minute, Jesus. That's not the Lord's Prayer. We know what we know that you're the Lord, but nonetheless, you know, let us teach you the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is actually that's where I had you turn, Matthew chapter six, verses six through thirteen. We're gonna be spending our time for a couple of weeks looking at the whole issue of prayer and Jesus is teaching us about prayer, and we're using, as I said, this jump in all place. Where we are in Luke, this is just our next, our next verse. We ended chapter 10 last time, and we're here starting, starting chapter 11. And Jesus gives a different rendition, if you could say, of what we know of as the Lord's Prayer. He's got a right to do that, don't you think, since, since he is the Lord? Uh, what you find out is, is there's a reason why these are different. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, as you know, at the Our Father. Notice he doesn't start with Our Father. He doesn't start with several, several things that you probably would recognize officially as the Lord's Prayer. He doesn't do that, and there's a reason for that. And the reasons are very simply, they're two different prayers, uh, given on two different occasions, under two different circumstances, uh, two different situations, two different times. Like, this one's probably at least a year or more after he gives the official Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, which is in the middle of his uh, Sermon on the Mount. This one is as a result of a question. The one in Matthew there's not a question asked. Jesus is teaching the sermon. He's, it's the Sermon on the Mount, and he, he prefaces the whole thing. Well, here's how he prefaces it. He says, as he teaches them, the, as we know at the Lord's Prayer, he says this, and when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. In other words, all you know is how the hypocrites pray. Don't be like them. Let me teach you. And then he goes to recite what we call the Lord's Prayer uh, which may be better, better called uh, model prayer or whatever. Uh, we have lots of, lots of different names we can give to it. But understand, these are, these are two different circumstances and are two different occasions and two different situations. Uh, the, the, this prayer in Luke chapter 11 is, is under a different circumstance. He's asked a specific question. Disciples realize how important prayer is. They're watching Jesus pray on a regular basis, listening to him pray. So what, we can't remember what you taught back what, months ago. Can you teach us again? Can you tell us again how, how we're supposed to pray? And so Jesus begins to teach them. I want you to notice something, though, that happens here. There's several things we need to notice about this. First of all, they don't say, the question isn't, don't teach us a prayer. It's not that, uh-oh, ring a little bit back there. It's, it's not that this isn't, can't be used as a prayer, but notice it was never intended to be a prayer. It, they didn't ask the question. It would be a prayer if they had asked the question, teach us a prayer. That's not what he, that's what they asked. Teach us how to pray. This is a how-to. I'm not saying you can't pray this. But I will say this. If all you do is pray this, you're really throwing out a bunch of the usefulness of it. This is a model prayer. This is an outline to be filled in. This is headings on a much larger sheet of what, what it means to pray. And so we're going to be going through over the next several weeks this outline. How do you pray? Well, 
you ask me that question, and I'll give you my answer. But I would suggest to you that the best answer is when, we go, when someone has gone to Jesus and says, teach us how to pray, and he gives an answer. So we're going to be focusing on that together. How, how do we pray? Well, this is a place where we're going to learn how to pray, and we're going to learn especially how Jesus taught to pray. So incredibly important. Prayer is a critical is- issue for us, critical to our existence, critical to our relationship to God. And since it is, we need to know how. Do you know how to pray? Jesus didn't leave us without instructions. So here he is discipling his disciples in the process of heading toward Jerusalem. In that process, he's also discipling us. We're going to learn how to pray the way Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And the disciples have been raised with nothing but heresy. Their, their main leaders were heretics, all of them, almost without exception. The main process of religion including prayer, was heretical. In other words, unbiblical. They'd come up with this system. They'd come up with this way, these, these things, and you had to jump through these hurt, certain hoops, hoops. And that's why Jesus prefaced the, the prayer there in, in uh, Matthew with this statement. Don't pray like that. Basically, everything you've learned from your culture, your religious culture, don't, don't do that. Don't be like them. Pray like this, right? There, there he is. Here's how we pray. Pray like this. Notice, notice several things that he does not say here. First of all, like I said, he doesn't say that this is a prayer. He says this is teaching you how to pray. You can pray this, but if that's all you do with it, you're really throwing out one of the most useful parts of it. The Lord's Prayer is a model prayer. It's, a, it's, it's, it's headings in an outline, and you're supposed to fill in the outline with your prayers. He's setting something up. He's basically creating a structure, and you're supposed to build into that. We're going to be taking apart this structure, like I said, in coming weeks today and in coming weeks, and seeing the kind of things that we can apply to this. Don't pray like the hypocrites, he says. Don't pray like them. Here's here's how you pray. But I want us to notice before we get into how to pray, I want us to notice several things that Jesus does not say. Notice, first of all, he does not say when they ask the question, teach us how to pray, he doesn't say, okay, everybody fold your hands. Doesn't say that. That was how I was taught to pray. How about you? Let me just say that. nothing wrong with that. N- nothing wrong with that. But it, Jesus, I want you to know car- carefully, does not say that. He also doesn't say, bow your heads, shut your eyes, either, does he? I was taught how to pray just like that. I was taught by my parents. Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, nothing no issues with that. The issues come when... Well, first of all, you need to, first of all, understand Jesus doesn't say that. If he was ever going to say it, he'd have said it right here. He doesn't say, "Get on your knees," either. So notice, there's no posture in this praying. There, there's no folding of hands. There's no closing. There's no certain way I'm supposed to orient my body physically in order to pray. Again, not that there's anything wrong with those things. Just that you understand, if you understand the principles of prayer in the New Testament, the main, number one principle in the New Pre- Testament is pray without ceasing. The disciple's life is a life where we literally breathe prayers all the time. If, in order to pray, I have to fold my hands and shut my eyes, and there's a lot of times I can't pray, like driving down the road. Probably not a good idea to shut your eyes. <laughs> fold your hands. You know, you need at least one on the steering wheel. Get on your knees i got to pull over and get on the side of the road. I mean, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, the, the, the guiding principle in the New Testament with regards to prayer is pray without ceasing. That means there can't be a precluded posture. Nothing wrong with getting on your knees. But do you have to get on your knees? No, because Jesus doesn't say that. Again, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say get on your knees. He doesn't say find a church or a synagogue. He doesn't say, go to the temple. So neither, there's not a posture for prayer, according to Jesus. There's not a place of prayer, according to Jesus. Can we pray at church? Well, of course you can. Is it more special in some cases? We have people occasionally throughout the week that will show up here. They're visiting, and uh, they just said, is it okay if we go into your church and pray? Uh, of course it is. Absolutely. But I want you to notice, Jesus doesn't require that. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't require a posture. He doesn't require a place. He doesn't require a time. He doesn't say, well, everybody look at your watch. They didn't have watches. You're going to sundial or whatever they had. When it gets about six, 
gather together to pray. There's lots of people that do that. The, 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 the New Testament church often did that. The, the synagogue did that. The, the, uh, the, the Jews did that. They prayed in the mornings. They prayed at noon. They prayed in the evenings. Three times a day prayer, guys, wasn't invented by the Muslims. It was actually the Jews. That's the way they did it. It was a Middle Eastern standard. There was just certain times of the day that you pray. But notice Jesus doesn't say, wait till those times, does he? So there's not a time to pray. I would say, though, you get up in the morning, you need to be praying. And if you think about it, it's easier for me, at least, to think, well, uh, there are some days that I will fast. The best times for me to pray is when, when I'm fasting is when I would normally be eating, which, is, of course, is what time do you eat? Six o'clock in the morning, noon, five o'clock in the evening. So that's when I, that's when I pray. When I fast, I'm, I'm praying at those times. Is there anything wrong with that? Of course not. Understand, Jesus doesn't put a time limit on it, though. Because how could he, since the New Testament principle is pray without ceasing? Of course he wouldn't do that. He also doesn't say there's a time. He doesn't say there's an attitude either. He, you know, well, you need to have the right attitude before you come before God. Okay. I mean, I would teach you that. But notice Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't say you better get your head screwed on straight before you come to God. Now, I would, I would think that's a good idea. But notice, Jesus, the, the, the important thing here is, is that you come however you are. So what, you're going to straighten up your heart because God doesn't already know it? Isn't that the purpose of prayer anyway? To come and lay yourself down in front of God and say, God, I'm a total mess. I'm a wreck, and I've made a wreck out of my day, and I've made a wreck out of other people's days. Isn't that what we're doing with prayer? See, we have, we, when we add these things to prayer that Jesus doesn't add, sometimes it puts limits we're not careful. Well, you always have to fold your hands. Well, that means I can't pray when I'm driving. Well, I always have to shut my eyes. That means I can't pray. I don't know when I'm up here preaching. I pray all the time when I'm preaching, by the way. You don't see me shutting my eyes falling off the stage. I, I, I have to wait till a certain time of day. I got to be near a church. Jesus doesn't say any of those things because none of those things should restrict us. It's fine to pray in all those areas, but don't let them restrict you. Don't let them keep you from it. I would say that because he says what he says there in Matthew, where you are, Matthew chapter 6. He says what he says under the heading, he teaches us, as we call it, the Lord's Prayer, under the heading of don't pray like the hypocrites. Because let me tell you something, they had all kinds of rules. Certain times of the day, certain ways you were to pray, certain attitudes you're supposed to have, certain posture you're supposed to have, and if you didn't fall into all their rules... You didn't pray as far as they were concerned. And notice Jesus doesn't use any of those things. He says, don't pray like them. So be careful with the stuff, whatever rules you may have. It's fine to have them. But understand, Jesus doesn't put any of those presuppositions, any of those preclusions to any of, any of that. Don't pray like them. He says, pray. Notice, we're going to go word by word through our prayer together. When you pray, notice what he says. What's your first word? Father. Is that the word you use? Is that the word you use? Now, are there, are there other good words to use with regards to God? Can we not say all kinds of words? I mean, absolutely. There are all kinds of words, aren't there? I mean, here's some words. Creator, Father, Sovereign, Transcendent One, Eternal Spirit, the Almighty. My, my most used word is Lord. It's just the first thing that comes, it's the first thought that I have. But again, I want you to notice what Jesus says. He doesn't use those words. Notice what he leaves out. Now, are those bad words? Of course not. When you find people praying in the Bible using the words that I just showed you, creator, sovereign, transcendent one, eternal uh, spirit, the almighty God. I mean, all these words, there's nothing wrong with those words. But when Jesus was asked the question, teach us, how or ask the given the opportunity teach us how to pray what does he say first word father you can use those other words if you're going to follow jesus you need to start with this one you need to start with this one this is a unique and special word special to those whom Jesus was speaking to, special to his disciples, special to the redeemed, special to those who have been bought by the blood of Jesus, hanging on a cross, dying for our sins, resurrecting to prove, prove that we've been saved. 
This is a word, listen to me, for which he has paid dearly for you to be able to say. People have been always been able to say Almighty and Eternal One and Great Father and all these things. But, but to call God Father, this is a very unique word. When he says this word, when he starts the prayer that way, he effectively breaks 100% with all other religions, including Judaism. Right there, he immediately starts a prayer unlike anyone ever had. He hands you a prayer, a system of praying, a model of praying that up until that point had not existed. People didn't say it. You go on the Old Testament, here's what you will not find. You will not find a single person in a personal prayer calling God Father. Now they refer to God as Father in the sense that he's Father over the nation or he's Father over the world, but no personal person refers to him as my Father. So exactly what nobody did from the dawn of time until the time of Jesus, Jesus says from now on, this is exactly how you are to pray. This is a special word. Again, nothing wrong with Lord, nothing wrong with God Almighty, nothing wrong with saying God. Of course he is those things. But he has always been those things, but there is a uniqueness that happens after the cross and after the resurrection so that those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ and the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus can say this word. He paid dearly for you to be able to do this. Don't take it off slightly. Don't think it's something small. Well, you can use it or not use it. I would say, mm-mm. This is a very special word. If Jesus was ever going to tell us how it was going to be done, he's going to tell us right here. Notice how he starts it. Start with Father. Start with Father. When you come to the New Testament, like I said, you find almost nobody in the Old Testament, in fact, no one in a personal prayer ever referring to God as Father. You get to the New Testament 65 times, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he's called Father. 100 times in the book of John, he's called Father. Something has changed, and it needs to change with us. Again, is it wrong to use these words? No, it's a, but it's, it's a mindset that we have to have. We have an approach and an opportunity and a situation and a circumstance that is very different from anyone prior to the cross. We need to take full advantage of that. Guys, listen to me. You can call him Father. No one could before. No one could it's unique with Jesus and the followers of Jesus. Jesus himself paid dearly for it. We start with Father because everything else hangs on that. The power of our praying, the ability, the access that we have is understood and formulated under the word Father. Father. Father, let's hear it from this perspective. You think of the differences. See if you can hear it. In the throne room of the universe, you hear titles like Almighty, Creator, Eternal Spirit. And then you hear a word, someone addressing God as Father. You hear the difference? So I'm, I'm in the executive boardroom of the world, and people are calling me all kinds of stuff. The awesome bill. That's a great word. It has a ring to it. The, the amazing dictator, or whatever I would be. But it's altogether a different relationship when someone in that room says, Father, to me. There's only a few of those. Everybody else can call me whatever they like, and probably do. Call me other names. I've been called my, by my brother's name my entire life. It doesn't bother me. There is only three people in the whole world that can call me Father. Very unique relationship. Born to me and to my wife. You hear the difference? There's a very different thing when you speak the word father not like anything else I, hear me hear me on this the demons call him god how are you better than them i hope you are not nothing wrong with using the word god of course he's god but but why when you have this word would you only use that word make sense why would you call him Lord? I, that's, a, that's, a, that's my most common word. I'm preaching hard to myself here. Why would I use only Lord? When the Bible tells me that every knee will bow and every, every tongue will confess to him as Lord. Every sinner, every lost person, 
Every person that's going to spend eternity in hell, are, they're going to call him Lord. Am I not better than them? I mean, obviously, no better. But I've been made better by Christ. Is not my status more than theirs? Is not our status greater than the only one? All they can do is call him Lord. All they can do is call him God. We can call him Father. Father is a very special word, very unique, very privileged word. There's only one group that can call him Father. The best men, the best women without Christ cannot call him that. But the worst among us, he calls his children. You see the difference? Do you see the difference? It's not a small thing. It's not a trifling thing. Jesus doesn't mince words. Jesus doesn't just throw out words. It, it, everything is precise. He teaches us. Here's what he says. The first thing you're to say is Father. And then he goes on to teach us there in Matthew, the next chapter. We're, we're uh, I keep going. Here we go. The next chapter there, you're in Matthew 6. The next, next chapter he teaches us what, what, it, what it means. Here's your access. What person is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf of bread, will give him a stone? Have you known some bad people? Have you known some people that you wouldn't trust more than 10 seconds? I've known some pretty rough people. I've known some people that, as we say in East Texas, not worth shooting. I've known some people that I, you know, I wouldn't give you two cents for. And, and, and most, some of those people I've known who, that have been worth less than a penny, in my opinion, which means nothing, have had children. Do you know how those people treat their kids? Not the best. They had a lot to learn. I mean, there's, there's, so much, there's so much privilege that I have being raised in a family with godly parents and who, who've directed me and shown me and, and, and taught me, and I've, I've seen how, how, how a parent's supposed to act and supposed to teach and supposed to talk. I've seen that. And, and these people that I knew that I wouldn't give you two pennies for, weren't, they weren't that good. But I'm telling you, they were just this good. They weren't, they weren't honoring mean enough to give their kid a stone when he asked for bread. They fed their kids. They, as best as they could, loved their kids, provided for their kids. There's, there's some, like I said, some of them are not worth shooting, but it, it, to a large degree, they did this. The worst among us still love our kids. That's what Jesus is pointing out here. Can't you understand that when you come to God as Father, that the worst people you know are still okay parents? You're talking about a perfect father here. How is he going to treat you? Can you imagine? Of course you ask for a loaf of bread. Fathers don't give you a stone. Parents don't do that. Or if he asks for a fish, will he not give him a snake? Will he? So, so if you, despite being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? See how important the word father is? It's so critical that we understand. You know, there's, there's, don't, we don't, again, we assign magic to a lot of things. It's magic somehow. We fold our hands or we hit our knees or we shut our eyes or we bow our heads. No, it's not. You can do those things. And neither is there magic, listen, in saying the word father. There's no magic in it. It's the understanding of who you're talking to and how he's related to you. And how you're related to him changes perspective on prayer 100%. The foundation of prayer is Father. Father. Where is it? There it is. When you pray, say Father. Say Father. Prayer is critical to our relationship. It's critical to our existence as believers. The New Testament, listen, commands us to pray. How are you doing with that? Keep the commandments of the Lord, right? Right? The New Testament commands prayer from us. You need to know how it works. If you're, going to be told, if you're told to do it, you need to know how it starts, right? It starts with our Father. It starts with Him. 
The New Testament commands us to pray. The New Testament commands us to pray without ceasing. That's why it can't be only, have to, only when I fold my hands, only when I shut my eyes, only when I bow my head. It's got to be when I'm driving down the road. It's got to be when I'm laying in my bed. It's got to be when I'm standing up here preaching. It's got to be when I'm walking down the road. It's got to be when I'm doing whatever. It's got to be when I'm out fishing. It's got to be whatever it is. Whenever I find my play, myself, i got to do it without ceasing. In fact, it tells us that. There it is. All right, wait, one more. Right? Well, back it up. Get my slides here. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. You breathe without ceasing, don't you? Prayer is to be that frequent. Prayer is to be that frequent. Prayer, prayer, like I said, we, we have this attitude. Of we need to come in with the right attitude. We need to come in with the right understanding. We need to have ourselves together and, and have our list. And if we don't have, we can't do it. You know, we have all these have tos. Jesus doesn't put any have tos in front of prayer. He just says, when you pray, start with Father. And then let her go. Whatever it is. Whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind, pray without ceasing, it tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray uh, always, it tells us over here in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. He was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not become discouraged. You just had this reiteration of needs to not stop. Needs to be going on all the time. God is looking for a relationship with you. If, if we bring anything to God, if God gets anything from us, that's what it is. He paid dearly for it. He paid dearly so that you could know him as father, and he could have you as a child. That's what matters above everything else. That's why he says, don't stop at all times. Pray always, pray at all times, Ephesians 6, 6 18. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions. It keeps using that word, right? With all kinds of prayers and requests. Be devoted to prayer. We saw this last week in Romans 12. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Does that describe your prayer life? Is it something you just hack away at every once in a while? Or, or could we call it a devotion for you? Would others call it devotion? For you, if they actually saw how often you did it and how committed you were to it. Is it actually a devoted thing? Notice, it's a commandment in the Scriptures. We're commanded to pray. Commands us that in everything, as we saw, prayer and through supplication, we are to make our request to God. There's nothing you don't bring to Him. There's nothing you don't say. What, what, what rattling inside of your head does He not already know anyway? Bring it to Him. Make it a constant relationship, a constant conversation. He's your father. He paid dearly for it. I mean, are you shocked by your kids? Anybody? So my kids, people say, you don't, don't you trust your kids? And my answer is, don't tell them this. No. They're probably watching. They know I don't. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I, I, I trust them, and they're good kids. My kids are going to do, they're going to do what's right. They have, but here, here's, here's what I really trust about my kids. I trust the God in my kids. I don't actually trust them. I don't trust myself. You really don't want to know. I just really don't, because I know what I'm capable of. But, but I, I, I occasionally come out with, hopefully more than occasionally, with some pretty good stuff, but I can't take credit for it because I know it's the God in me. It's not actually Bill. It's actually God overriding Bill. Bill's thoughts and Bill's words and Bill's actions and Bill's decisions, and it turns out pretty good because why? Because there's a good God. I trust the God in Bill. I don't trust Bill. I don't trust, I don't trust my kids either. But I trust the God in my kids. I, I trust, I trust the, 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 what's, what's going to change them is this, is this committedness, this, this life, this, this relationship that God has for us. And so they, they need to take, as we do, everything to God in prayer. Take Him your whole self. Christianity is it, the life that we live down here. Part and parcel of it is God just fixing us on a daily basis. That's why God says, you need to keep, talk, keep talking to me. Keep, 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 keep talking. Let's talk through this. You're, you're a little on the edge there. You're a little off. You're a little mixed up. You're a little upset. You're a little arrogant. Keep talking to me. We're going to walk through this. 
We're going to work it out. And that's exactly what he does. Keep talking. Prayer is to be a way of life. It's to be constant. It's to be relentless. God never tires of hearing us. He never, you can never pray too much since he told us to pray without ceasing. You can never pray too much. You can never pray with too many, about too many things since he told us to pray about everything. Can't do it. You can never say too much to him. You can only say too little. You can never speak too often to him. You can only speak too uh, less to him. You can't come into his presence too boldly, too often, since he never is wearied by his children. Never is. Pray without ceasing, he says. How do we know that? It's true. Because, because why? Because we start with Father. We start with Father. He's not boss. Oh, yeah, he is. He's not Lord. Oh, but yeah, he is. He's not the Almighty. Oh, but yeah, he is. He's not the Creator. Oh, but yeah, he is. But ahead of all that, ladies and gentlemen, he's Father to us. He is Father. See, I come to you differently if you're my boss. Or that's all you are. You're my Lord. That's all you are. You're my creator. That's all you are. Now, there's a different relationship there. It just ha There has to be. Totally different when you take the word Father and you start that way. I want to ask if you would, bow your heads as we come to him this morning. Father, we thank you that you have not left us as orphans. You've given us your Holy Spirit. And by your Spirit, you've given us your word that directs us into all truth. And part of the truth, Lord, that we surely need to know is how to be rightly related to you. How to, now that we know Christ as personal Savior, how do we walk in that relationship with you? It starts with how do we speak to you? And so we so need to be directed and instructed and reminded and corrected about this process that we call prayer. Help us to remember to start with Father. Help us to remember that it, it, there's no end to this. We may say amen, but it needs to start with the next thought, with the next sentence, with the next process, with whatever we're facing. Lord, teach us, we ask, how to pray. Thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you that we can know you as Father. Thank you for that precious word. Help us to take full advantage of that word, Lord. We know that you've intended for us to. We ask these things in the Son, Jesus, your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.